Stretching 73 miles across the north of England today, Hadrian's Wall was often described as one serving as the northern frontier of the Roman Empire. But is this true? More on that later. Today I've taken you to a section of Hadrian's Wall in the north of England near Greenhead, just east of the Roman Army Museum. At the top of that hill is Walton Crag, one of the Roman turrets along Hadrian's Wall. Standing here, you're immediately struck by a defining feature of the Roman army. Roman soldiers weren't just soldiers, they were part-time engineers, part-time craftsmen. It's remarkable that 2,000 years ago, in a foreign land, whilst fighting a war, the Romans managed to erect a structure of this magnitude, an engineering project that pretty much no other army in the world would have achieved. Building a wall of this magnitude in a foreign land 2,000 years ago doesn't just take incredible imagination, bravado and dare I say arrogance, it also takes incredible skill, discipline and organisational power. This is one thing that has always struck me about the Romans, their ability to throw up massive structures in foreign lands whilst fighting wars, um, almost it seems at a drop of a hat. For instance, during the conquest of Gaul, dur during Julius Caesar's conquest of Gaul in the Battle of Elysia, the Romans built dual fortifications. When Vercingetorix and his men were held up in Elysia, the, the fortified town of Elysia, Julius Caesar's army built a wall around the position to, to lock Vercingetorix within Elysia, and you had the Romans on the outside. When a Gallic relief army was on its way, however, the Romans then built a second wall to protect them against the, the relief army. So you had Elysia, a Roman wall, the Roman position, and then another Roman wall um, around the Romans, which is quite remarkable. Like I say, Roman soldiers were part engineers, part craftsmen, as well as having the ability to fight. But what is the truth about Hadrian's Wall, and why and how was it built? To understand this wall, we need to understand the context in which it was built. Hadrian's predecessor, Trajan, had greatly expanded the Roman Empire. When Hadrian came to power in 117 AD, the Roman Empire stretched from Britain to the Middle East. Many local tribes in various parts of the empire were rebelling at various points as well. It was time for fortification. Fortifications were nothing new for the Romans. They had built various fortifications across their empire, in particular in Germania, to control local tribes. Roman defensive fortifications are often referred to as limes, and two fortifications in modern day Germany stretch an astonishing 340 miles from the northwest of the country to the Danube in the southeast. If we turn our attention back to Britain, the most obvious reason why Hadrian's Wall was built was for the Romans to fortify their position in Britannica and to keep the barbarians, as they saw them, north of the wall at bay. Emperor Hadrian, who ruled from 117 to 138 AD, went to Britain in 122 AD and, in the words of his biographer, was the first to build a wall 80 miles long to separate the Romans from the barbarians. The barbarians Hadrian is speaking of, which is ironic considering that Rome was the one occupying these lands, um, probably referred to numerous tribes um, whose names probably changed name over time as well. One tribe or one tribal confederation that we know um, it did refer to was the Caledonians, which was a Roman name, um, as all these names essentially are, um, for a people in, in the north, northern section of Scotland today, the land we call Scotland today, known as a ferocious people. Another tribe, another barbarian tribe from the Roman perspective, um, or freedom fighter from many other perspectives, um, was the tribal confederation of the Mai Tai. I have made a video on them before, um, but they were a tribal confederation in the land we call Scotland today, um, a little more south compared to the Caledonians, around the kind of Stirling area in general. One of the earliest references to the Picts, those painted people, also comes in relation to Hadrian's Wall. A Roman writer in 297 AD spoke of the Picts and the Scots, which meant the Irish at that point, attacking Hadrian's Wall. The Picts themselves, many argue, um, are connected to the Caledonians themselves. These are Roman names for um, tribes of ancient Scotland or tribal confederations of ancient Scotland. Uh, and the complexity of these tribes we don't really know, um, as the Romans probably grossly oversimplified um, the, these tri the tribal makeup of these groups. Um, but yeah, many argue that the Picts are essentially an offshoot of the Caledonians, or potentially just a later name for the Caledonians. Various groups attacked Hadrian's Wall 
wall over the centuries. And the Romans essentially used Hadrian's Wall um, nearly until the end of Roman occupation of Britain, which ended in 410 AD. Now we have covered the attacks from the north, those barbarians and Celts and fueled by whiskey and shortbread, animated by the spirit of the Loch Ness Monster. How many cliches about Scotland can you fit into one sentence? What if we flip this idea on its head? Although it's certainly true that there were attacks from the north on Hadrian's Wall, and the Romans wanted to build a barrier to help keep the northern tribes out to a degree. Some argue that the wall also helped Rome keep guerrilla fighters from the tribes of ancient England in. When I was doing a little research for this video, I rewatched Bruce Fumey's video from Scotland History Tours um, on Hadrian's Wall that I'll link below. Um, I would definitely recommend it after this video. There was one aspect in particular that, that I thought was very interesting and important to highlight. Um, obviously the fact that the, the wall was built um, to keep the tribes to the north out to a degree is pretty well documented. But it notes that some scholars um, argue that there was also a secondary re reason uh, for the wall from a defensive military purpose. Um, there was somewhat of an insurgency um, among some of the tribes of ancient northern England around that, that point, according to many scholars. And many of these insurgents um, were hitting Roman positions and then fleeing north. Hadrian's Wall did not just protect the Romans to the north, it protected them to the south as well. It served as a barrier to stop insurgents fleeing north after attacks against Roman positions. Another important point to note about Hadrian's Wall is the sense of awe it must have instilled in the local populations around this area, as well as serving a, a functional, um, you know, defensive barrier, um, sort of military function um, from a more practical standpoint. Hadrian's Wall clearly had a psychological and propaganda impact on the people of this area. How could anyone resist the power and the might of the Roman Empire that could build such a thing? Now that we know the why, how was the wall constructed? Although we often think of Hadrian's Wall as a stone wall, initial sections of the wall to the west were actually made from turf, probably due to a shortage of materials, with this section later replaced with stone. Ditches in front and behind the wall also offered an extra layer of protection. Towers, fortlets and forts were built at intervals along Hadrian's Wall to house soldiers and the initial construction of the wall took around six years to complete, with later expansions made. The wall was constructed by approximately 15,000 men, although some sources say as much as 30,000, and after it was built, around 10,000 soldiers were stationed along it. For reference on the height of some of the remains, this section of the wall was slightly taller than me, and I'm around 6 foot 3. There are also interesting sites close to the wall. Vindolanda is one for instance, a Roman auxiliary fort that is just south of the wall and was occupied by the Romans decades before Hadrian's Wall was built, with Vindolanda occupied by the Romans from around 85 AD to 370 AD. As well as a fort, Vindolanda was also home to a town that was just outside the fort that supported and entertained the Romans. Tablets have also been found at Vindolanda, detailing aspects of Roman life. Reconstructions of what parts of Hadrian's Wall may have looked like can also be found at Vindolanda, even though the site itself is about a mile south of the wall. Hadrian's Wall was often referred to as the Roman Empire's most northernly frontier, but this isn't exactly true. This is another case of England trying to steal Scotland's claim to fame once again. I'm joking of course, but to find the true northern frontier of the Roman Empire, we need to travel about 100 miles north. In 142 AD, Antonius Pius would order Roman troops to construct a wall that would stretch right across the land we call Scotland today, from Old Kilpatrick um, on the River Clyde to Bowness on the Firth of Forth, a wall we now know as Antonine Wall. This wall was the true northwestern frontier of the Roman Empire, around 100 miles north of Hadrian's Wall, a wall the Romans constructed in the north of modern England. Today I've taken you to Rough Castle in the Falkirk area. This was an important site for the Romans along Antonine's Wall. The wall itself took 12 years to construct and ran 39 miles across the country, and it stood at 3 metres high uh, and 5 metres wide. The wall itself was built on stone foundations, but it was constructed mainly by turf, hence why there's not much of the wall left today. A ditch was dug, a massive ditch, um, just north of the wall, by the Romans, as extra barrier of 
of defence, and this is still present today, as you can see. These strange holes in the ground at Rough Castle are actually the remains of a Roman defensive booby trap that was just north of the wall. The Romans hid sharp wooden spikes, smeared in animal fat to encourage sepsis in the victims, in the holes, and covered the holes with ferns to conceal them. These traps are called Lilia, meaning lilies, a name coined by Caesar's army years earlier given how they look. These traps were obviously meant to give the Romans an extra layer of defence against the people of ancient Scotland, and Antonine's wall was attacked on various occasions throughout its history. But who were these people of ancient Scotland? First up is the Caledonians, a tribal confederation uh, that were considered to have occupied the region more north um, of, this, of this territory in general. The Caledonians were known as a fierce tribe of ancient Scotland, or tribal confederation, and they fought the Romans on countless occasions. Second up is a tribal confederation of Scotland that you perhaps haven't heard of unless you've watched a previous video of mine. The Mai Tai, a tribal confederation of ancient Scotland that occupied an area extremely close close to the wall. The Might Hill and the Ockles in the Stirling area, which is just east of where I'm standing now, it was the stronghold of the Mai Tai, and they probably came into conflict with the Romans on countless occasions. The Romans used diplomacy as well as military tactics on numerous occasions as well though, and there was potentially agreements um, at various points in the short time the Romans occupied this area. I know for instance that Roman coins um, have certainly been found all over Scotland, and they were given to, to the native peoples at various points. For a more detailed breakdown of the Mai Tai, this ancient tribal confederation um, of the land we call Scotland today, um, I'll link a video above um, as I made an exclusive video on the Mai Tai. I will also put the link in the description below. Another ancient tribe in this area was known as the Damnoni. As far as some of the attacks on the wall um, and some of the general conflicts in this general area, one of the signs that was reading um, as I was walking around this place um, states that according to legend, a Pictish army led by Graham or Grimm breached the wall about 500 metres west of here. Very quickly, if you enjoy my videos and you would like to support my work in general through Patreon and get exclusive benefits for only a couple of pounds per month, all the links will be in the description below. Thank you and now on with the video. Antonine Wall was protected by 16 forts with small fortlets between them and trip movement was facilitated by a road linking all the sites known as the Military Way. Decorative slabs were created by the Romans to commemorate building the wall. The bridge nest distance slab is one. Found in the 19th century in Bowness, and this beautiful slab marked the building of the eastern section of the wall. Antonine's wall was obviously a way for the Romans to fortify their position in Scotland, the land we call Scotland today and it was a way to keep the barbarians as they saw them north. The wall also served as a way for the Roman Emperor at the time, Antonius Pius, to flex his muscles. After all, his predecessor, Hadrian, had a wall in the, in the north of England, what we call England today. So why shouldn't he have a wall named after him? The area around the wall became a strict military zone, with around 9,000 Roman troops stationed along the wall. The Roman presence on Antonine Wall was quite short-lived, however. When the Emperor Antonius died in the 160s AD, the Romans retreated back to Hadrian's Wall. A combination of various factors, the death of the Emperor of course, the headache of managing such a long supply chain to the Northern Wall, as well as repeated attacks from the natives, meant that manning and maintaining Antonine Wall just wasn't worth it for the Romans, and they retreated south to Hadrian's Wall. Both Antonine and Hadrian's Wall form a fascinating aspect in the history of both Scotland and England, and show the depth of history in these lands. Speaking of the Romans, what was the genetic impact of the Romans on Britain? To find out, please click here. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and hit the bell and tell your friends and family about this channel. For ways to support, they will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.